welcome all of you to the fourth edition of the Africa Health Agenda International Conference, AHEC 2021, themed Decade for Action, Driving Momentum to Achieve UHC in Africa. My name is Desta Lago. I am the Global Partnership Director for AMREF Health Africa, and this is the largest convening of thought leaders in the region, and one which actually reflects an Africa-owned health narrative. Over the course of the next three days, there will be 5,000 delegates who are registered to attend this conference, of whom more than 50% are women. And in addition, 54% of our women speakers uh, or our speakers are women. So how amazing it is that we are actually opening up the conference today in a wonderful way to celebrate the International Women's Day, recognizing all these women leaders on whose shoulders we stand, and certainly the young leaders to whom we pass the baton. We have a stellar program lined up for you for the next three days. This opening session is being live streamed by CNBC. We hope you will also amplify the information you hear through social media handles. The hashtags for this conference are hashtag AHEC2021, that's hashtag AHAIC2021, or hashtag Africa Health Agenda. And now I have the honor of introducing Dr. Githinji Gitahi, who is the global CEO of AMREF Health Africa. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much, Desta. I was here enjoying the video and what great African music there and calling this a decade for action. Many of you will know that we have only 10 years to go before all our commitments to humanity are actually achieved and universal health coverage has only those 10 years. And yet we know that many countries across the, con uh, across the world and specifically in Africa are still struggling with achievement and a clear roadmap um, uh, to UHC. We will hear a lot during this conference, during different sessions that are partner shared, but I first want to start with the protocols and I will be recognizing the presence of His Excellency, the President Uhuru Kenyatta, who will be joining us in about five minutes to open this uh, conference. We have, of course, uh, the honor of hosting the Director General, um, Dr. Tedros Athanom. And we also have Dr. John Kengasong, who is the Director of Africa CDC. We have several ministers, including my own minister here in Kenya, uh, Senator Mutahi Kagwe, and several other ministers. We have diplomatic calls. And I want to give a big shout out to all women in the organizing committee, I will let you know that um, uh, the, the, the women, the organizing committee was made up majority of women and uh, all the women in this organizing committee, partners and speakers. But this conference is co-hosted by myself and my chair of the international board who is here with us and will be speaking with us. You know, Amra Health Africa is co-hosting this with many partners, but of course, Amra Health Africa has an international board and the chair, uh, Dr. Charles Okehalam is also here with us, and I would like to recognize his presence and support uh, at this conference. He'll be speaking to us shortly. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we will do uh, all these protocols before the President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta joins us, but I would like to uh, actually also take this opportunity to thank partners. Uh, Africa CDC to start with, who are co-hosting this with us. So thank you, my brother, John Kengasong, uh, for the leadership and for uh, answering the call across the continent and for, to us to co-host this conference with you. But I would like also to pay special attention to specific um, partners who are actually um, at the top level of the hosting of this conference, uh, Takeda Pharmaceuticals, Roche Pharmaceuticals, the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, IFPMA, Johnson & Johnson, and then a lot of other partners, more than 20 partners, who include private sector, UN agencies, civil society, and others who are here, who have enabled this conference uh, to be hosted here. There will be key initiatives that are going to be launched or discussed at this conference. The first one, uh, first and foremost, is the State of UHC in Africa report, which will be done by the AHAI Commission for the State of UHC in Africa. They will be discussing at the end of this um, uh, opening session 
after the opening ceremony, the state of UHC in Africa and the report, an executive report has been developed. And um, this is an important milestone because this commission has been led by Africa, is actually all the commissioners are African experts looking at health from an African point of view. This is why we think that this is a, an extremely important report and of course has borrowed heavily from all the work done by agencies like WHO, World Bank, UHE 2030 and others. I'm glad to say one of the UHE 2030 co-chairs will also be speaking at this conference. Secondly, we will be talking about an index called the Sustainability Index for Future Proofing Health in Africa which has also got uh, uh, many experts who have been working on it. It's going to be launched as this um, uh, conference has been supported by Roche. We are also going to be seeing a growing partnership between the Gates Ventures and uh, Amref Health Africa, launching an initiative called Exemplars in Global Health that is going to be looking at creating partnerships uh, for South-South learning. As you know, the Africa Health Agenda International Conference was created by Amref Health Africa to give a space for Africa to discuss the Africa Health Agenda. And of course, that cannot be done without recognizing all the global partners who actually support Africa to achieve lasting health change. Uh, but that needs to be seen from an African point of view and solutions need to be contextualized for Africa. As we have seen with COVID-19, which we've worked on very closely with WHO, WHO Afro and Africa CDC, it has been extremely important to ensure that all the responses we give are contextualized to the continent of Africa. I would now like to introduce the chair of the AMREF International Board, uh, who is here with me, Dr. Charles Okehalam. Dr. Charles Okehalam, who is based in between, I ask him all the time, where are you based? He says he's based between Lagos and Joburg and the rest of the world. And uh, Dr. Charles Okehalam is a renowned scholar, a businessman who has been involved in financing in many ventures and sectors in Africa, and also has a great heart for sponsoring female students in different universities. So he actually applies his own resources to ensure uh, that female education is advanced. He's been a member of many councils of different universities in the continent. Currently, he chairs the board of trustees of Amrev International University. He is an honorary professor of Vist University and also a recipient of the Hublot Norman Senior Fellow Award from the Bank of England. I can tell you that having worked closely with Charles, he has a great passion for health in Africa, including the economics of it, and a great passion for the development and leadership of women. Charles, over to you for your uh, three-minute remarks. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kipinji. Um, thank you uh, for this uh, opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to add to Kipinji's hearty welcome to this fourth edition of the Africa Agenda uh, international Conference. I'd like to follow protocol and recognize His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, Dr. John Nkengasong, and indeed everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I will quip that when the CEO, the group CEO of, a, of an organization uh, flatters the chair with colorful words and the chairman should stand back a little bit and then wonder what, 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 what that is about. So I want to thank um, Gitinji for those very warm words and take, take it with, um, with, the, with, with the great intention with, with which it was, um, it, it was put forward. His Excellency President Kenyatta, ladies and gentlemen, we have to recognize that today is International Women's Day. And I'm proud to serve as chairman of the International Board of AMREF Health Africa. AMREF Health Africa is an organization which is totally committed to gender equality and gender equity. And those two things are different. Um, but, it's in, but it's important that there's great focus and emphasis on them. And as Gitinji pointed out, I'm, I am, I'm very keen on that agenda. So this is an important day, and it's auspicious that we launch this, um, this conference on Women's Day. So happy International Women's Day to everybody, 
um, and I hope that um, it's going to be a great day and that we will reflect on the importance and the significance of the role of gender in our lives. Um, it has been, as I said, 60 years, more than 60 years, since Sir Archibald, Mackindo, Michael Wood, and Tom Rees established AMREF. AMREF continues to take the lead in thought leadership on health matters across the continent, and, and we try to contribute to the general discourse at a global level as well. And of course, it's important in the context of the, of, of the, of the current systemic shock that we face now. And in fact, that's what COVID is. It's a systemic shock across all sectors. It's not just a health crisis. So this conference is unlike the other conferences in that it comes at a time when we need actually to find ways to address our health issues in a holistic manner, in a systemic manner. Um, and COVID has also shown us, um, if I may say so, that the, that the global commons, that health is a global commons. It's not for one nation or for one other nation. It's, there is no discrepancy. It, is, it, it has no um, particular uh, um, sectoral or social or, or national uh, focus. It's across the board. And then critical to that, and if I throw my hat in as an economist, the, 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 the issue that we have to ask ourselves, particularly in the context of Africa, is what is the bigger shock? The systemic shock is across the board, but what is the bigger shock? What can we contribute to addressing the, um, the, the, the discourse on the trade-offs between the economy and, and the health issues? And I think that the conference would gain by us thinking about those issues carefully. And if you look at what's happened to African economies, you can see what this challenge, this health challenge poses, the challenge it poses. The debt uh, service ratios have, have increased, GDP, um, debt to GDP ratios have increased, terms of trade have gotten worse, and there's evidence um, that there is a bit of a commodities rally, but nonetheless, the fiscal position, and therefore the health expenditure, domestic health expenditure capacity of African countries is being greatly um, reduced. And therefore, there, there is a challenge. And this challenge is going to be augmented by the situation with, um, with regards to vaccines. We have to be very, very mindful that we address this challenge and we find ways in which um, uh, we can cooperate to meet this challenge. So as I pointed out, health outcomes in Africa are improving but remain low. Um, the continent has 17% or so of the world's population but has 23% um, or so of the global burden of disease. Our mean life expectancy is more or less seven years lower than the global average. Um, and we have had over the last 15 years, a huge burden with regards to HIV, Ebola, cholera, measles, and the rest of other challenges, and now COVID. So we are convening here today an opportunity to, to share all our learnings across the continent and internationally with the whole range of stakeholders. The, the privilege that we have of having His Excellency here uh, uh, from the perspective of government is critical and having a whole range of other um, 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 government representatives here because they are the custodians of policy. And it's important that, 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 that we are able to take on from them and contribute to what they're thinking and share this thinking. So policymakers and government have a critical role to play. The private sector is critical, 65% of health is delivered through the private sector. And, and so the private sector has this critical role to play. Of course, we know of civil society's importance role, important role. And academia, the thought leadership, the sharing of ideas that come out from, um, from research and, um, the, and the dissemination of that research. Um, so it is, it, is, it, it is my hope that we are able, ladies and gentlemen, to deliberate successfully come up with solutions because unlike the previous um, um, conferences and I, I and I need to repeat it we face a real challenge and so uh, in convening this conference we need we, 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 
we need to find ways to find solutions that are efficient, solutions that are going to meet our immediate challenge. The, 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 so I'll focus now on three issues very briefly. I think, as I said earlier, international cooperation will be the key to the solution of, of and solving the COVID issue. Not pointing fingers, but cooperating across the board. And I hope that international partners, donor agencies, um, the, 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 the G7, the, the G20 will um, support and put as much pressure as possible for this international cooperation to take place. Then the second point is that we have to have effective communication. We have to be able to communicate our, our policies effectively to people. We have to enhance this. Gitinji made the point about how much I travel, um, but I, I don't think I'm unique in that regard. Um, but I wanted to just use, uh, make, make a quick point that I have observed across the continent in the last month or so, the vast difference in the way in which the communication of this challenge of COVID is being put out. There, there, there is no standard um, um, method. And I know it can't be standard, but there is a challenge that um, in some places, uh, I, I have this uh, per perception that the threat of COVID is not being taken as seriously as, as it should be. And we need to communicate this effectively. And then finally, Thank ladies you. and gentlemen, we need to, efficiency, um, to enhance efficiency in our allocation of resources. Um, and I think if we can do those three things, we'll be on the right path. And I think that this conference uh, is going to be an interesting conference that leads to um, uh, much thought leadership so echoing from Kitinji's welcome address, this is our collective conference. There is no other large convening for us to discuss Africa's health agenda. You are certainly um, at the right place. I want to thank you again for joining us and I'll hand over back to you, Kitinji. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, um, I, I, I know we are going on to the next speaker, but I would like to recognize the presence of His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta, President of the Republic of Kenya. Thank you, Your Excellency, for joining us, and we'll be coming to you shortly. Thank you very, very much. Uh, the person speaking prior to your joining is the chair, the, 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 the chairman of Amref Health Africa International Board, Charles Okea Halam. I would now like to request my brother, um, John Kenga, Dr. John Kenga Song. John Kenga Song is the director of Africa CDC. Uh, a renowned virologist, uh, worked earlier with CDC Atlanta. Uh, he is a Cameroonian virologist. We are really proud to have uh, an, 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 you know, an, an African of such status actually lead the Africa CDC. So John, over to you for your quick three minute remarks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, my brother Gitingi for the um, wonderful uh, organization. And I've always admired your organizational skills uh, since the first time we met a few, few years ago, how you managed to mobilize all of these people. I don't know what you, you do to them so that next time you can let me know so that I can use the same formula to get everybody to come to this platform. So greetings to His Excellency President uh, Uru Kenyatta and uh, Excellency Dr. Tedros Gabriel Jesus Ahanon. Uh, greetings to all the uh, uh, excellencies who are uh, on this platform. But let me first of all join uh, uh, all of us in celebrating uh, today's uh, International Women's Day. I think uh, this is our day. Uh, we are all uh, uh, gathered uh, today because of women uh, that gave birth to us. So this is our day. So, and greetings from the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention from the headquarters of the African Union. Thank you for the opportunity to share these brief remarks on this very important discussion of accelerating universal health care coverage on the continent. As we all know, the global fight against the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic continues into the second year, uh, continuing one of the most unprecedented health challenges and economic crisis globally. As a matter of fact, I've always stated that I don't know of any crisis that have uh, threatened our continent since independence as the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that we are currently fighting. The African Union's uh, Agenda 2063, 
the continent's strategic framework for transforming Africa into the global powerhouse of the future identifies her as one of the core areas of focus, including investment in infrastructure, uh, workforce development, and expansion of health services across the continent. Against this backdrop and in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic, ladies and gentlemen, investing in universal health care has never been more critical. As we have seen in the past with outbreaks and pandemics, for example, the 2014 Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo and in West Africa, and even now in the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen how pandemics can significantly disrupt healthcare services, whether it is in immunization programs, maternal and neonatal healthcare, or routine testing and treatment for other illnesses, including HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Investing in the competent workforce development is critical to achieve the expanded uh, universal health coverage on our continent. Ensuring that public health systems have a strong workforce, requiring starting early, understanding the gaps and risks in the current healthcare systems, and building capacity through collaboration and partnerships. On this, uh, let me pause and repeat my favorite uh, um, proverb. I always say here is that you do not uh, uh, dig your words when you are thirsty. You dig your words before you are thirsty. So you build your health system, healthcare system before you need them. You don't need, you need them and you start building them. I think we have to change that paradigm. Developing preparedness response plans and investing in workforce development is key to ensuring quality services delivery during what would otherwise be a difficult and stressful time in public health professionals. These factors are critical to growing our capacity to providing a multitude of healthcare services across the board. That is what we mean by a resilient healthcare system that can be used in addressing our current needs and then prepare us to fight uh, subsequent uh, pandemics or outbreaks. In order to accomplish this, the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention welcome local and global partnerships with multi-sectoral national regional and global organizations committed to scaling up universal health care coverage across our continent. I'm confident that this forum will yield great discussions and innovative strategies to grow universal health care across our continent. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. At this time, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, who is the Director General of the World Health Organization to share his remarks. I thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, my brother. And thank you, uh, Dr. Gitahi. Your Excellency, President Kenyatta, Dr. John Kengasong, Dr. Gitahi, Dr. Okia Halam, Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends, Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to join you today. Asante sana. And I would like to add my recognition of International Women's Day. Globally, women make up 70% of the health workforce, but women are unrepresented in leadership in global health. In February, WHO launched the Gender Equal Health and Care Workforce Initiative to promote gender equality in health leadership. When COVID-19 first emerged more than a year ago, we were deeply concerned about its potential impact in our continent in Africa and other regions with fragile health systems. So far, almost 4 million cases have been reported from African Union countries, and we have lost more than 100,000 of our brothers and sisters we know that the real numbers are higher, but the pandemic is a surprising paradox. Some of the wealthiest countries with the most advanced medical technology have been hardest hit, while many countries in Africa have managed to prevent or control widespread community transmission. Our continent's relatively young population means Africa has not seen the same scale of severe disease and death as other regions with older populations. Africa has also benefited from its long experience in applying basic public health tools 
to prevent and respond to outbreaks of infectious disease. The approval of safe and effective vaccines is now giving us all hope of bringing the pandemic under control. For more than a year, we have been working with our partners to ensure equitable access to vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics in Africa. So far, around 14 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been delivered to 19 countries in Africa through COVAX, and more countries will receive doses this week. This is a good start, but we have a lot of work left to do and barriers to overcome. But even once the pandemic recedes, we will still be left with many of the same challenges we had before. There is no vaccine for poverty, hunger, inequality, climate change, child marriage, or many of the other problems our brothers and sisters face on a daily basis. The pandemic has highlighted the centrality of health. When health is protected, everything is possible. When health is at risk, everything is at risk. The pandemic has taught us that health cannot be seen simply as a product of strong and prosperous nations, but as their foundation. A healthy population is a productive, innovative and resilient population. Far from taking the focus away from universal health coverage, the pandemic has only shown why it's so important. Achieving UHC requires investments in resilient health systems, especially in strong primary health care, with an emphasis on promoting health and preventing disease. An important part of that journey is ensuring a reliable supply of safe, effective, and high quality medicines across the continent. To that end, WHO is working with the African Union and the Africa CDC to establish the African Medicines Agency. And I call on all AU countries to ratify the treaty so that Africa Medicines Agency can enter into force. More than two years ago, I was honored to join President Kenyatta in Kisumu to launch Kenya's pilot program on universal health coverage. WHO is proud to have supported Kenya in the design of this project. And we're committed to supporting all countries in Africa to end the pandemic, improve preparedness, and build the strong, resilient health systems for the healthier, safer, and fairer Africa we all want. And I would like to recognize His Excellency, President Kenyatta's commitment and leadership on universal health coverage. And thank you so much also for joining us today. That shows your commitment to UHC. Thank you. Asante sana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director General Tedros. You know, you've driven the vaccine equity conversation so strongly. And I clearly remember your statement that the world is facing a catastrophic moral failure on vaccines. So um, thank you very, very much for joining us. And now it's my singular honor to welcome um, His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, who of course Tedros has referred to as a champion of UHC. And uh, I'll be inviting him to speak to us now and also declare the conference open. Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining us today. And the time is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gitahi. I appreciate it. and. Uh, let me begin by saying it is a great pleasure to join all of you this afternoon as we discuss this great and most important subject. And I begin by recognizing my good friend and dear brother, Dr. Tedros Adahanan Gabriesus, our Director General of the World Health Organization, who has ably led us in Africa and indeed the whole world in combating this pandemic that faces us. Let me also recognize Dr. John Gengasong from CDC Africa and say what a pleasure 
and honor it has been to work with you, Dr. John, last year as a member of the African Union Bureau. And um, it's been wonderful and your contribution to helping us fight this pandemic shall always be greatly recognized. Recognize also Professor Charles Okehalem, the Chairman of Board of Directors of AMREF Health Africa, all members of the Diplomatic Corps, the health and policy and business leaders, and indeed, most importantly, our young health advocates who have joined us today. We meet here today as the world continues to grapple with the worst international public health emergency in over a century. In its wake, COVID-19 has changed the way we live and work and has heralded a new normal in which virtual meetings provide a safe way for the world to continue engaging. It is my great pleasure to join you, as I have said, for the opening of the fourth Africa Health Agenda International Conference. And I congratulate AMREF Health Africa and the Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention Africa for using this series of conferences to maintain a momentum on this most critical agenda. The theme of our conference this year, the decade for action, driving momentum to achieve universal health coverage in Africa has a special significance in Africa and the world. The devastating social economic impacts of COVID-19 pandemic have demonstrated to all of us the centrality of health in our development efforts. Indeed, it is clear that our global economic and social recovery hinges on how effectively the global community, continental as well as regional bodies and individual states are able to control diseases. I'm pleased to note today the strong participation of our young people in this conference as speakers, but also in this plenary session. The youth are a key constituency in driving momentum towards UHC and they should never be sidelined. We should engage with and empower our young people and give them the knowledge and skills to take charge of their health. In this context, I would also urge the conference to give special attention to health, health issues that plague our young people, which include teenage pregnancies, alcohol and substance abuse, lifestyle diseases, epidemics such as HIV and AIDS, as well as mental health, amongst others. We should also not lose sight of the fact that some of these health issues have been exacerbated during this COVID-19 pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, our forefathers envisioned an African continent that was free from poverty, ignorance, and disease. We have indeed made significant progress towards the realization of this vision. Diseases such as smallpox and polio have been eradicated due to sustained vaccination efforts. The burden of malaria cases on our continent has also been greatly reduced through effective coverage with insecticide treated nets and treatment of pregnant women and children in endemic areas. Equally encouraging, access to reproductive health services has improved maternal health outcomes, resulting in fewer maternal and child deaths across our continent. As a result, Life expectancy in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa has increased from 40 years in the early 1960s to 64 years currently today. A little bit with, a wide, with wide variations across our region. However, ladies and gentlemen, there is still plenty that needs to be done to achieve our SDG 3 
which entails ensuring healthy lives and promoting the well being for all at all ages. African countries, including Kenya, continue to suffer from the double burden of disease, which can be drastically reduced with much better health care. Indeed, the pre prevalence of preventable diseases such as respiratory conditions, diarrheal diseases, HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria, as well as the rising burden of non-communicable diseases, including diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, such as heart attacks and chronic respiratory diseases, such as asthma, continues to pose a very significant challenge to us on the continent. So ladies and gentlemen, what then should be the Africa health agenda for 2021? And this, if we are to achieve, as we have agreed, universal health coverage by the year 2030. I would like at this juncture to propose a few priority areas that I consider should anchor our health policies and programs as we move forward. The first is that we need to give greater priority to primary health care, including maternal and child health services, water sanitation, hygiene. Indeed, during this COVID period, all of us have been amazed by how simple hygiene practices such as hand washing introduced during this response to this pandemic have reduced diarrheal and other diseases. The second is to increase access to healthcare services. Currently, about 600 million people across our continent do not have access to adequate health services. To address this, we must make increased investments in physical facilities, medical equipment, drugs, as well as trained personnel. In Kenya, we have equipped nearly 100 hospitals with advanced medical equipment in operating theaters, radiology, renal units, and intensive care units. We have also started a rollout of 24 primary health care facilities in the informal settlements of our capital city, Nairobi, where millions have little access to health care services. The third is that we need to make health care much more affordable. Many families on the African continent resort to selling off family assets in order to pay for medical care for their loved ones. Currently, at least 15 million people in Africa are pushed into poverty annually because of out-of-pocket health care payments. In Kenya, we have partly addressed the problem through the removal of user charges in dispensaries and health centers, as well as through the introduction of free maternity health services. Currently, we are embarking on a national program to ensure universal access to health hospital insurance fund through mandatory enrollment and a full government subsidy for the poor and most vulnerable. Fourth, we need to harness the innovative energy and creativity witnessed in Africa in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Many African countries are now locally producing protective personal equipment and other medical supplies. I urge health providers, investors, as well as our development partners participating in this conference to nurture such innovations, especially those that are led by our young people. These local level successes in fighting COVID-19 can be a strong foundation for increasing capacities and capabilities for domestic manufacturing of essential medical commodities, drugs, vaccines required 
in other disease and healthcare situations. Fifth, we need to strengthen health sector collaboration and coordination across different levels of government, across different nations, within countries, with the private sector, and also with our citizenry. During the past year, we have witnessed the power of collaboration and citizen engagement. If we are to achieve UHC by 2030, the mission must not be one of just the national government alone. It will take the combined effort and close collaboration of national as well as county or devolved leadership, religious leaders, civil society organizations, our private sector, and indeed our ordinary citizens. Between our nations, we must collaborate and coordinate. And as I said earlier, we have shown this when the African Union Bureau of our Assembly of Heads of State and Government successfully developed continental COVID-19 strategies and the Africa Medical Supplies Procurement Platform. This we did by working together. Similarly, the unprecedented global response that has enabled us all to develop a framework for confronting the pandemic and to develop vaccines in record time should be harnessed towards securing universal health coverage by 2030. Indeed, I must say that I am a proud African that today our African continent is only weeks behind the developed world in terms of making vaccines available to our citizenry, especially those on the front line. Six, we need to improve health security. And as COVID-19 has demonstrated, our global health systems are indeed vulnerable. A health problem in one country can quickly translate into a global catastrophe. We therefore need to redouble our efforts towards achieving universal health care with a greater focus on public health and a reduction in health inequality. Seven, the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated that political will and leadership is strongly correlated with successful health responses and a greater resilience in our health systems. And I therefore call upon all leaders on our African continent to give health the highest political commitment and to pursue the attainment of universal health care as a critical driver of social development and economic prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, I urge us all to reject the pessimism and cynicism that may come from our current circumstances. Instead, let us embrace empowerment that comes from optimism and hope, even in uncertain times. The theme of this conference, the Decade for Action, driving momentum to achieve universal health coverage in Africa, presents all of us with an opportunity to reflect, to learn, and indeed to relearn and to re-examine previously deployed health strategies in terms of their effectiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, the achievement of universal health coverage is a personal priority of mine and my administration. Indeed, it is one of the pillars of my administration's social economic development plan, which we have dubbed the Big Four Agenda, and it is also embedded in our Kenya Vision 2030. As I address you today, as I said earlier, Kenyan health workers are receiving COVID-19 vaccines to ensure that they are safe, even as they continue to battle on the front lines of this pandemic. We could not have achieved this without working closely with all of you and indeed with all our partners. And for this, I applaud each and every one of you. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I am informed that this conference will launch a report on the state of UHC in Africa. 
This review by experts from the continent will tell us how far we have come in the UHC journey and how we can accelerate it. And I, I personally look forward to receiving the report and to working with all of you to achieve this critical agenda. As I conclude, I want to join my fellow participants to celebrate the great women, not only of Kenya, but all the world over in celebrating the International Women's Day 2021. This year's Women's Day has chosen the theme, Choose to Challenge. This theme, expounded, illustrates a challenged world, is an alert world, and from a challenge comes change. I therefore impress on everyone to borrow from this theme and celebrate our women and recognize their critical contribution, not only to our societies, but also to our economies. Last week, I joined elders and leaders from Samburu County here in Kenya to launch our campaign to end FGM and early child marriages by the year 2022. And I call upon all participants to also join us in this effort to ensure that women are able to play their rightful role in society. I join the many Kenyans to honor all women who have been in the front line last year and to date in our fight against COVID-19 as doctors, as paramedics, as nurses, as community health workers. And I say to all of you, Happy Women's Day. It is now my distinct pleasure and honor to declare this conference officially open and to wish all of you very, very fruitful deliberations. Thank you all. Fantastic. Please unmute yourself and let's give His Excellency a big clap for a fantastic speech. I think the commissioners for UHC report will take note of your seven points, Your Excellency, because having read the draft report, we should actually have had you as a commissioner on the state of UHC in Africa. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Your Excellency. The conference now is officially open. I must thank all the guests in the opening ceremony, uh, Director General Tedros, uh, Dr. John Kengasong, Africa CDC, and the Chair of the AMREF Board, Dr. Charles Okea Halam. Your Excellency, to notify you that after this session, we are moving straight into a fireside chat with the Minister of Health in Kenya, uh, Senator Mutai Kagwe, and the Minister of Health in Rwanda, uh, Daniel, and they're going to be moderated by one of the great women who's been leading this conference. She is Cameroonian by birth, but currently working at Amref Health Africa here in Nairobi, and she will be the moderator. So I'm handing now over to Lolem Gong, Chief of Staff, Amref Health Africa. Thank you, Excellency. We invite you to stay, but you may leave at your pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll be inviting Dr. Tedros to segue also to the Fireside Chat. Uh, thank you so much, DG, for accepting to join the Fireside Chat. Thank you. My name is Lolam Gong, and as Gipinji said, I'm the Chief of Staff at Amref Health Africa. Our moderator, Dr. Sanayat Viseha, was unable to join us due to an, an unexpected conflict in her schedule. My colleague, Desta Laku, and I will have the pleasure to moderate this fireside chat. And hopefully we, um, the both, that hopefully both of us will be able to fill Sanaya's shoes. It is our great pleasure to be here today. And we're honored to host this chat with Dr. Tedros Gebreyesus, Honorable Mutahi Kagwe, Health Cabinet Secretary of, Secretary of Kenya, and Honorable Dr. Daniel Gamije, Minister of Health of Rwanda. So all three leaders are here, of course, as we know, in their own right, and as representatives of their countries, and more importantly, as champions of health for all. They have firsthand experience in leading the UHC agenda and in responding to the COVID pandemic. I will first turn it over to Desta, 
for um, just a few questions to Dr. Tedros, and then we'll proceed with both C.S. Kagwe and Dr. Gami J. We're thrilled to have all three of you here with us today. Thank you and welcome. The only question that I had, and perhaps you can think about it and uh, come back to it at the end, is uh, we heard His Excellency uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta emphasizing the importance of political will and leadership as a critical driver for social and economic development. So we know you've been passionate and vocal on the importance of political will to drive and you know prioritization of health by government. So you've even published a report on that. And perhaps you can just think uh, as our uh, honored uh, guests, the ministers uh, discuss, just give us some thoughts. What are some examples which come to mind of you know, how Africa is doing in this light? So uh, you don't have to answer it now. We can certainly move on to uh, the questions for uh, the ministers, um, but just keep that in mind and we'll come back to that. Is that okay with you? C.S. Kagwe, this last year, as you know firsthand, has been quite challenging for so many countries and individuals across our continent, especially for women and girls who have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID pandemic. In your perspective, what have been some of the key lessons learned, um, especially here in Kenya? Over to you, C.S. Kagwe. Thank you very much. First, uh, again, I want to recognize and uh, thank uh, very seriously the leadership that uh, we have with us, Dr. Tedros, uh, John Kenga Song, and I want to congratulate John uh, for the new, the, the, the new appointment again, and to thank you for what you have done. Um, I, I, to, to an all protocol observed, uh, let me go straight to uh, the lessons that we have learned. I think, and, and they are both positive and negative, I think the first in terms of the positives is what uh, President Kenyatta alluded to just a few minutes back, and that's to do with the fact that um, we have learned that with um, just changes in the behavior that we have, and especially in terms of hygiene, and in terms of uh, how we live at home and elsewhere, we can do a lot in terms of prevention. That has led to us as a government uh, to revive our policy in terms of uh, what is the best way to prevent disease and fight disease and infections. And that is prevention, prevention, prevention. And I think that for too long, we have laid too much emphasis on cure and, and, and provision of medicine and provision of hospitals and prevention is actually the key what we want to do is to stop people from going to hospitals, is to stop people from getting medicine. And the only way to do that is to lay a special emphasis on prevention. And to that end, what we are doing is introducing uh, family health, where we want to take uh, medical care to people's homes rather than people come to institutions of medical care. And that's a fundamental shift in the way that um, uh, we run uh, healthcare in the country. The second thing, and it was alluded to as well a while back, I think um, has to do with communication. And, and I think that one of the things we also picked up is that communication and communicating with citizens is not just a, 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 a mandate of um, uh, policymakers, but I think that we should expand that to include as many of our experts in communicating as possible. The authenticity and trust that people have, for example, with doctors communicating with them directly. And this is what we did. We put our doctors on, uh, on TV, we put our uh, frontline workers on TV to communicate directly, rather than just us, the politicians. Being on TV, we wanted our doctors to be on TV. And that created um, a certain element of trust as far as um, uh, whatever message we had was concerned. I think for me, the, the other very important one is that we learned that in a crisis, you can really just depend on yourself or your, or your continent. You cannot depend on the international community to resolve your problems. And I think that towards that end, one of the things that we really like to see is enhanced local manufacturing. And I'm glad, I'm very happy today, that um, some of the sponsors of the, the current meeting we are in is the International Federation of pharmaceutical manufacturers and associations. I think I would like to send a clear message to them 
that one of the things that we have discovered is that it is possible for you to have money and not to have supplies. Mm -hmm. We all know what happened. And if there is any, any uh, minister in the continent of Africa who will tell you the most frustrating uh, times that we lived through, the most frustrating, the panicky sides we went through, is when we did not have PPEs, yet we are getting cases in our hospitals. We did not have reagents, yet we wanted to test. Because why didn't we have reagents? We don't have reagents being made on the continent. Secondly, the equipment that we have are closed systems that we cannot use um, in an open way, getting reagents from anywhere. They are closed systems. The countries where we could get the closed system reagents had themselves burnt the export of reagents. So we have got a system, we have got a machine, but the reagents can't come to you because it's a closed system. So we learned that, and therefore moving forward, there are a number of things I think that come to mind. And we must be brutally honest with ourselves about this. First, as a continent, it's absolutely crucial that we do whatever we can. We develop a, a cooperation as a continent so that we can have plans that are economically feasible to investors provided that uh, we know that we can uh, buy from them as long as they are within the African continent. I think that's something to think about moving forward. The second thing uh, to think about moving forward is that we have got to structure an economic environment, particularly the taxation regimes, that allow for and favors local production of pharmaceutical products and commodities over and above um, those imported from the outside, which means then three, that we are prepared to cooperate with those organizations, those, those pharma companies, so that uh, instead, of just, instead of them just locating the organizations out in Tokyo and in New York and other Western nations, that they can also begin to think seriously about cooperating with us on PPEs, on PPP, <laughs> on direct uh, uh, private sector involvement, so that uh, we also can have a share of those organizations and farmers operating from the African continent. Because four, it informs also the fact that we were exporting jobs for simple things like malaria nets and so on. We are exporting jobs at a time when we are already devastated by COVID-19 in terms of enhanced, increased joblessness. So to me, it appears that uh, this cooperation we have learned from COVID-19, the experiences that we have gone through have made us more aware of our vulnerability. They have made us more aware also of our potential, especially because now we make a lot of those things. We no longer import PPEs. We are making them locally. But I think that it has got to be something that we think about consistently, comprehensively, and sustainably. Because what we don't want to do is to get caught with our pants down come the next pandemic. And it is coming. There will be another one. So are we going to be in the same spot or are we going to have learned something and moved on? Thank you, C.S. Kagwe. I think those were some really, really key lessons for us to take away. Um, we are actually discussing some of those during this conference. So I would encourage delegates to look up for those sessions on manufacturing, on entrepreneurship, et cetera. But coming now to Dr. Daniel, uh, all the way, if we just think back to even Dr. Um, His Excellency President Kenyatta's uh, address to us today, and C.S. Kagwe has mentioned this as well, it is extremely important for us to ensure access to healthcare services. It is important for us to make healthcare available. It is important to, for us to make sure that we, are, we ensure that no one's left behind. So thinking about um, Rwanda's um, excuse me, Rwanda's uh, policies, Rwanda's plans for, for UHC um, towards achieving health for all. How is Rwanda's UHC plan centering the voices and the needs of those who are often overlooked? Dr. Daniel? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the experience of Rwanda is that uh, after tragic events of uh, the genocide against Tutsi in, uh, in, in, in 1994, the government decided to go for uh, a policy which includes everybody. No one should be left behind for any reason. 
And for that, uh, initiative were taken to make sure that uh, dialogue, policy dialogue, will be including everybody to ensure that, especially for the healthcare access, we make sure that uh, even a poor person can have access to care. And for this reason, the government uh, developed a scheme called Community Bed Health Insurance, where for poor people, the premium for their adherence to this scheme is paid by the government. And it allows them to, to be treated from the primary health care up to the tertiary uh, level of care. This is an initiative for avoiding uh, out-pocket catastrophic expenditure, which really might be a reason for excluding this uh, kind of people at, uh, at the level of, of care. But there are also other reasons for exclusion, apart the financial uh, barrier. We might have also uh, geographical barriers, which can exclude people just because they are in remote areas. So the government uh, regularly uh, is mapping the country so that uh, wherever there is a need for a health facility, being an hospital, being a health center, being a health post, uh, this facility is constructed. But with clear sharing of responsibility, the central government is in charge of constructing hospitals, but local government is in charge of constructing health center and health posts. And this is part of a performance we sign annually by the central government and uh, the decentralized government with His Excellency the President, so that at annual basis, each level will be accountable for what they sign to achieve for increasing geographical accessibility for everybody to, to health care. There are also other barriers which are more uh, related to culture, and especially we can see it uh, in uh, some services like uh, the family planning, where we still have 14% of unmet need from our recent demographic health survey. Clearly, we need to increase dialogue, and especially with the people who, are, who, can, who can influence, especially religion, civil society, to make sure that uh, everybody is concerned and service can be accessible to different category of population. There are some services in family planning which are not given by uh, uh, some of our partners, like religions. We need to make sure as a government that we have alternative possibility of giving those services through public health facilities near to uh, religious faith-based uh, health facilities, at least to ensure that the population can have, can have access to, to an alternative uh, solution. And also we need to again, to mobilize uh, different uh, sectors so that, uh, because the government can't do everything. The mobilization of the private sector is really key. Today, we can see that uh, we encourage the private sector to invest in health, especially in tertiary health care, and also uh, in primary health care where the government can be in partner in, in PPP model with uh, those uh, private partners by facilitating them and give some incentives, like giving them land, uh, giving them some tax exemption so that private sector is attracted to come and invest in health so that we'll help to address uh, some uh, issues related to geographical accessibility, again, for health uh, for, for, for our communities. And final, it's about some legal barriers. Today, uh, we have some legal barriers like related to uh, the reproductive health age. We, we, we are with, the, we have the, a big issue of uh, pregnant teenagers. For them, the fact that they can't have access to, uh, to pills or any other contraceptive method, just because the reproductive health, which is 18 years, can't allow them to, to go in pharmacy and be receiving those uh, pills. Uh, this is a limitation. So we are discussing with the parliamentarian so that uh, this legal barrier can be removed so that uh, a, a young girl can have access to different contraceptive method because we know that they, they are sexual active. So starting 14 years, they are already sexual active. So a kind of, this kind of legal barrier should be removed just because we can't only rely on engaging them, discussing with them, because at the end, we, we just discover that each year we have 
and un un unwanted preg uh, pregnancy among uh, teenagers. Thank you so very much uh, to both of you, Honorable Kagwe and Honorable Ngamije. Um, you've raised some really important points uh, and issues uh, in your comments, and we appreciate that. Um, if we were to just come back to you both, and you can uh, uh, perhaps uh, the Honorable Kagwe can start, and uh, Honorable Kagwe. Gamije can uh, also uh, share his opinions since you've raised a lot of important questions. What do you think is the one thing that not enough people talk about uh, when it comes to leadership in global health? Uh, and then why do you think that is the case? So I think there, there have been quite a number of things raised, but in your opinion, what is the one thing that people don't talk about? And Honorable Kagwe, maybe I turn to you. I, I am not sure that there is one thing that we don't talk about. Perhaps, uh, perhaps there could be something that they don't emphasize about. And um, uh, for me, obviously, leadership is everything. And at this point, I mean, you know what has happened to uh, Dr. Tedros when he's been fighting, you know, uh, from his office regarding um, the reagents, first to begin with, secondly, to do with um, the vaccines. And, and there's an example, if he wasn't fighting as much as he does, and if he wasn't, and he didn't put as much emphasis on the equity aspect as much as he has, but my position is that we probably wouldn't have, um, we would not have the vaccines here at this time. The second thing I think in, uh, and I think the one thing missing, if you ask me, is that in the previous arrangements within the African continent, we have tended to operate singularly in a siro mentality, where we believe that a geographical boundary is in itself enough to allow you to do the things that you want to do and to um, negotiate on your own. Now, whereas uh, bilateral, you know, bilateral negotiations have their place, we have learned one thing, that uh, leadership must work together. On this one and on other global health uh, challenges, that we are going to have, we must work together. We must become a big shareholder in discussions on the healthcare platform and on the healthcare boardroom. And the only way you become a big shareholder is when you work together, all leadership combined into one. And speaking as an African continent, we will demand a lot more, we will command a lot more than we currently are. So leadership, bringing leaders together is always a problem. You know, because essentially everybody is a leader and everybody thinks that they are leading where they are. And the challenge, therefore, is how do we uh, allow ourselves, subdue ourselves, so that we can be able to take on a common platform and negotiate and work together within the African continent. If we can do that, we will achieve a lot more than we are even dreaming about. This is a clear situation in leadership where Two plus two, we are equal to five. Thank you so much, Honorable Kagwe. This was in, indeed really important, you know, working together, leaders working together as shareholders, which is actually a term I have not heard. But thank you so much uh, for raising that issue. While we're, I think there is a sound uh, a challenge with your sound. I am not hearing you and perhaps our listeners may not be hearing you as well. So Dr. Tedros, can I come back, circle back to you while we are waiting for a response from Dr. Ngameche? Uh, perhaps you can just share your thoughts on what you've heard. Thank you very much. Um, I think the um, lessons uh, Minister Mutahi Kagwe and um, Minister Daniel Gamije raised are, are very, very pertinent and, and, and I fully, I fully uh, agree. Um, maybe one thing I'd like to stress is on the vaccine equity and what um, uh, Minister Kagwe said, especially on building Africa's manufacturing capacity. Uh, local production. That's very, very important. Uh, we, we have seen it from uh, this pandemic, even starting from the PPE and now with vaccines, um, the you know, lack of equity in distribution um, is, is affecting actually many countries 
uh, especially the developing countries who do not have manufacturing capacity. So I think that's a big uh, lesson and I would like to uh, stress that. But when we talk about manufacturing capacity, the other lesson is, uh, it has also been said, uh, the national capacity starting pro from prevention, uh, from healthy lifestyle and then prevention and the rest is, is, is key. Uh, so um, the national capacity includes, of course, uh, preparedness. When I say national capacity, uh, it's what we're discussing today, universal health coverage. Uh, when I say national capacity with an universal health coverage, it means strong primary health care that encompasses uh, prevention. And then uh, national capacity means uh, things that are done in terms of uh, preparedness as well. So um, for many countries, I think the, pro the situation could have been better if there was better national capacity. By the way, when I say national capacity, it's not just to countries in our continent alone. Even because of lack of national capacity, especially in public health, even the most, um, <laughs> the, um, the, you know, the countries, the high, even the most high income countries have been affected because their investment was more on medicine than in, in public health or in primary health care. So that's, I think, a big lesson, not only for our continent, but including for the rest of, of the world, strong national capacity. Then the other lesson is, um, when we say political commitment, it could be investment, it could be many things. Uh, but the other very critical thing that we have seen and which affected the um, uh, pandemic response is when uh, politics deviates from science and evidence. Uh, instead of su supporting the experts, instead of supporting the evidence, instead of supporting the science, uh, you know, it goes contrary to science and evidence, and that actually helps in, in spreading the virus. Uh, that's a big lesson which we have seen globally when some leaders were just moving the other way, contrary to what science says. And um, of course, in, in our continent, we haven't seen that, but in, in many uh, uh, countries, um, in a good number of countries, actually, we have seen where the experts were not getting support, but even the worst, uh, politics was moving contrary to to science. I think we have to take that as an important lesson because, um, you know, you cannot mobilize the community, you cannot pass the same message to the citizens uh, if politics and science are not actually supporting uh, each other. Uh, I think uh, uh, Minister Daniel Gamje is, is, is back. So I'd be happy if he, he, he could uh, take the floor. Um, uh, and then I would, um, if there are um, there is time, I can add, but just maybe a couple of things from what you said, Desta, earlier is uh, political will is very important. Political commitment is very important. And we see it, by the way, the, the two countries today are the best example uh, in, in, in Africa who are really doing their best, both Kenya and, and, and Rwanda. And um, their commitment to universal health coverage is, is very clear. And it comes from their commitment, belief that health is a fundamental uh, human uh, right. And that, I think, when the political will comes, not just in terms of only investment, but in a belief that it's a fundamental human right, that becomes, uh, that opens actually uh, several uh, doors and that can help us to uh, really uh, achieve universal uh, health uh, coverage. Uh, so on political commitment, I think the two are good examples and they have already been saying it, uh, but the central aspect of it is health and the human rights. And with the pandemics, we have already seen the centrality of health. And I hope the whole world has, has learned its lesson now, not only our, our continent, and that health will be put at the center. 
uh, and will be taken as a serious uh, rights issue and a means to development. With that, thank you so much. This time, back back to you. Thank you, and uh, I think we have the Honorable uh, uh, Gamenji with us. So maybe we give you, we lost you earlier, maybe we give you just a, sh uh, a short moment to respond to this uh, question that was put forth about the one thing that is not talked about, and, and we will wrap up this session. Thank you so much. Thank you. I was saying that uh, leadership in global health, uh, leading to kind of international partnership, uh, can't do everything. Uh, it can't replace uh, key function of each country in defining vision for health, in defining objectives where the country wants to go, in allocating resources, and in mobilizing stakeholders for implementing the health agenda and make those stakeholders accountable. These things, you can't import them from outside. It's it's from the country. It's from the vision and the commitment of each country. And generally, people uh, don't want to say it. Uh, and for a simple reason, sometimes it's a good uh, reason for explaining any failure that uh, we failed because maybe we're expecting this from outside. Why we should normally plan it in country and make sure that uh, those external resources, being financial, being technical, are just coming to facilitate implementation of what we decided to implement as a country. Thank you. So thank you so much, um, Honorable Dr. Daniel Gamije, CS Kagwe, and thank you, Dr. Tedros, for honoring us, for giving us your time. Um, today, we are just extremely glad that you took this time with us and gave us a few lessons to think about throughout this conference. And so with that, I will move forward with introducing our next session. Our next session is the launch of the AHEC report on the state of UHC in Africa. We have been talking about universal health coverage. We've been talking about why universal health coverage is important in order for us to have to achieve health for all. Talked about our marginalized populations, talked about health financing. Now this next session is the session that really goes into some of those details and talks about where we are as a continent. And so with that, I will turn it over to the moderator for this session, Miss Victoria Rubadiri, who is an award-winning journalist and a senior news anchor on C Citizen TV here in Kenya. Over to you, Victoria. Now, moving on to this discussion for this session, heard through the various discussions and the speeches how critical the next few years will be for Africa if we are to meet universal health care targets by 2030. It's not a lot of time. Now, this next session will help put things into perspective as to where we are as a continent in this journey to UHC. We'll be delving into the State of UHC in Africa report that reflects on the successes the barriers and the lessons learned along the way. Now, without further ado, because time is not on our side, allow me to introduce my distinguished panel. We have Dr. Solange Hakiba. She's the chief of party at USAID Rwanda, heading the Integrated Health Systems Activity Project. Also the co-chair of the AHEC Commission. You also have Professor Edwin Baraza, director of the Nairobi program at the Kemri Welcome Trust Research Program and head of the Health Economics Research Unit. He also co-chairs the AHEC Commission. You also have Dr. Shakira Chunara, who is the youth ambassador with the African Union, a public health practitioner and Operation Smile ambassador for South Africa, as well as an AHEC commissioner. Uh, we also have Honorable Gabriela Cuevas Baron. She's the co chair of the Universal Healthcare 2030 Steering Committee uh, and a member of parliament in Mexico. And last but not least, we have Linda Arthur, who is the Africa Implementation Leader for Vaccines, Global Public Health at Johnson and Johnson. Uh, coming to you and just to understand what this undertaking entailed. Uh, it is a huge one considering what you had to gather in terms of information, 
uh, from the continent and where we stand on universal health care. What did this process entail? Thank you very much, uh, Victoria. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, the commission um, was uh, put, you know, it, it was put together in November of last year. And so we've had uh, three months of intensive work trying to answer three questions. Uh, the first question is really taking stock on where we are as a continent with regard to the achievement of universal health coverage as a goal. And secondly, interrogating some of the challenges that the continent faces and the opportunities that the continent has uh, to accelerate progress. And lastly, to think through recommendations. Um, the work has entailed a lot of deliberations across uh, the commissioners. We have 11 commissioners across uh, 10 countries. Uh, a lot of different deliberations between them. They bring together a lot, a lot of experience and, and diverse skills. It has also entailed uh, you know, standard research. So carrying out literature reviews, extensive literature reviews and carrying out interviews with uh, people across the African continent at the country level, and also talking to people at the regional level, you know, key informants, people with uh, information on universal health coverage at the continental level. And the most exciting part of our work has really been hearing from people in the streets, as they say. So people that uh, you know, do not work necessarily in the health sector, people that are not necessarily politicians or technocrats and so on. So we carried out uh, a call uh, for people out there to give their stories, to give their pastoral stories about their experiences uh, of UHC from their different countries. So our work has entailed bringing together all of that into answering the three commission questions. Fantastic and amazing to hear the angle you've taken in terms of hearing the voices of the ordinary citizens, uh, certainly making it uh, that much more richer. Um, let me move to Dr. Chunara. Considering Africa's large youth population, you know, how should decision makers progress toward attaining universal health care? And of course, bearing in mind that we need to prioritize the needs of the youth. What are some of the low hanging fruits in your view? So Victoria, thanks for the question and, and it's great to be checking in and a shout out because I'm getting a few WhatsApps, for example, from Tanzania and all across. Um, but you know, as, as I sort of think about this report and I think there's an intersection between gender and youth and I think there's two low hanging fruits that we can look at. The one will be the policy and legislative environment and the other one will be the programmatic level. The first thing I want to say about youth is that we can't um, tailor our healthcare services just by saying youth. Adolescents and then young people are two distinct categories that we first need to think about. I think the report, for example, sheds a spotlight on service coverage. It, sets, uh, it sheds a spotlight on, on quality and on governance. And I want to share a very, um, a very big example that sort of stuck with me since I engaged with young people in Uganda. There was young, one young woman who said uh, during this community meeting that um, when she went to a healthcare facility, the gatekeeper was essentially asking for a $100 bribe. And if she couldn't pay the $100 bribe, she would have to pay, um, she would either get Panado or not get any contraceptives. So I think that's very powerful in terms of the type of quality, the governance issues which translate to the youth level. Um, in terms of quality. Okay, we appear to have lost Dr. Chunara. However, we will link back with her. Uh, Dr. Hakiba, I see you are back online. Let me come to you. Um, as the driver of this whole process, we heard from your colleague, Professor Baraza, on what it entailed, talking to the average citizen to hear their concerns, uh, to bring a different perspective to this report. But, you know, what else went into putting this uh, huge project together? Thank you very much. And apologies for dropping off a little bit earlier. I think this, what I can say is that this process was very engaging. For, for different uh, stakeholders and experts that were involved. Uh, not only the commission team that was, um, that made it that deliberate move to really involve each and every um, category of, uh, of uh, actor in the field of health financing, in the field of universal health coverage to make it happen, but it also went beyond 
con um, considering the, the, the commission members and going to a key interview uh, with specific um, uh, renowned um, actors that are in di different countries. As you know, all, not all the countries are the same level for the UHC and not all the countries face the same issues. So it was important for the commission to bring in as much as expertise as possible, not only uh, on a technical aspect, but also to listen to those policy makers, to those opinion leaders that are actually supporting the implementation of the strategies that are leading to a successful UHC uh, uh, um, system in a country. So beyond those uh, key uh, um, uh, interviewers, interviewee, uh, we also took another step to listen to uh, the success stories that are happening in the communities. It is important that uh, when you look at the different uh, members of the commission, you need to recognize that there was a diverse expertise ranging from, uh, as I said, uh, policymakers, health uh, specialists in health economics, health financing, social inclusion. We had renowned clinicians and also distinguished academic professors. So um, that expertise alongside with the researchers' uh, perspective, alongside the family medicine and primary health care practitioner was meant to make this report as comprehensive as possible. And then the report comes also with different uh, other documents that will really help and support uh, the countries, the people, all the, the audience that will be uh, uh, consulting this uh, report to grasp the best of what they can do from where they are at this point. Fantastic. I can see Dr. Chenara is back with us. Uh, I'll give you just a brief moment to uh, sum up what you were speaking on, on the governance issues and the programmatic areas of the report in respect to youth. Dr. Chenara, the floor is yours. Really, Murphy's Law that I dropped off, but, you know, just to jump back right into it. As I was saying, um, what we're finding with adolescent healthcare is that there are massive legislative and policy barriers and legislative in terms of um, really what's the age of consent to access healthcare services. This is a massive barrier. Um, and that's something simple that we can start to address throughout the continent. When it comes to child marriages, there's conflicting legislation uh, between religious um, legislation and health legislation or child marriage legislation. And how do we sort that out? So this is really a throwback to the policymakers listening in during this conference. How can we address that? Um, then on the level of adolescent sexual and reproductive health policies, yes, we have them. Africa has very recent policies throughout the continent. What we need to do is to finance these policies. Um, we need to make sure that it's really aligned to universal health, co uh, health coverage. Uh, Zambia, for example, has an adolescent policy that's centered on the six building blocks of UHC. I think that's largely exciting and it, it provides sort of like gold standard for the rest of the continent. Programmatically, um, again, it goes back to, if we're speaking about adolescents, um, school healthcare services are essential for nutrition, um, for HIV services, yet we're seeing that um, there isn't enough buy-in, there isn't enough resources. School health is going to be central to universal healthcare co or, or coverage. I think we also need to think about university environments, workplaces. So we need to break down the categories of youth that we're looking at. Um, and really finally, within the continent and working in this space, we see that there's so much of SRHR, sexual and reproductive health or HIV efforts. We're seeing the non-communicable disease community working separately. How do we start to bring the work and the effort together um, uh, we're looking at one adolescent, we're looking at one young person, um, and I think this is what we have to consider. And again, you know, speaking to the report, when we're looking at the intersections between youth and gender, our young women specifically um, are facing these barriers so much more. And, and we need to think about this at the policy level and the program level. I want to take a collaborative kind of tone now and bring Linda in here. Uh, you play in the private sector. Private sector will be critical in ensuring we hit those UHC uh, targets. COVID-19 has shown us 
how important it is uh, to have collaborations and partnerships uh, and kind of solidify those relationships between government and private sector. But can we hope that there will be, you know, greater ease in doing business across the continent and just leveraging on those partnerships between the private and public sector in your view? Victoria, thank you so much for um, this question. And it's a pleasure to, do, to join this conference. So it's a great question as well. So I'm sure you've all followed how governments and private sector companies like my company are collaborating to fight the COVID pandemic. What we've done is we've rallied behind one foe, the virus. What I've seen is that the private sector has been especially agile in COVID responses across almost every aspect of health systems in countries, from supply chain all the way to diagnostic services. Both, both sectors have actually come together in a really unprecedented way with a willingness and openness on both sides to work together, okay? Um, the, the, the partnerships that have been forged have been really deep and I'm hopeful that they will remain so and get deeper post COVID. So I wanna give you an example. Seven years ago, we were faced with a potential pandemic threat, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Partnerships were formed between private sector and governments, okay, to build cap capacities for future outbreaks. Today, we are once again seeing the virus back in two countries on our continent. And there is unity behind one goal. Let's stop the outbreak. What we cannot forget is that this kind of collaboration is possible and must become the norm. We must collaborate across sectors to work together on a single agenda, not unlike the one AMRF is announcing at this very, very, very meeting. Ebola, COVID-19 have shown that it's possible when we focus and play, um, play on the same team um, for us to win. We must hold this spirit and channel it towards universal health coverage. And on the ease of doing business across the continent, I think that's really a good question as well. So it's this same sense of unity behind a common agenda that gives me hope for a new way of working with great, greater ease um, amongst all sectors. I believe it because I've actually seen it. Before this pandemic, my role in my role, I would travel to almost um, all corners of the continent weekly meeting with stakeholders across the board. Now, what are we doing? We meet virtually, we speak more frequently and the conversations have changed. We know we all have one goal and arrive at the virtual table with a singular focus. We are solving challenges together with an openness I have not seen before, Victoria, I really haven't. And, 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 and in these ways, COVID has really reduced the barriers that exist um, between us um, and, and has built more trust and collaboration um, in all, all the sectors. And I'm hopeful that we will continue um, to stay the same team. And, and so the collaboration that we've found cannot be applied to uh, more health challenges um, um, that need our collective focus. Certainly, and I want to zoom out a bit and take this to the global level, if you will. Honorable Bahron, you, you sit as a co-chair really at the center of this effort to achieving uh, universal health care. You co-chair the UHC 2030 steering committee. Uh, how do you plan on advancing the conversation towards getting there by 2030? And, and for you, um, what's most important in terms of if you looked at your to-do list, what's the most important thing to hit? Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I think the most important part is political will. We need to take a decision. Uh, yes, there's a lot about content, about implementation, about a lot of important details. But the first step is to have political commitment. And especially today on International Women's Day, we need to, to remind us that this is 
about a commitment, about a decision, but also with a, a gender perspective, with gender lens and having a, a very specific focus on women and girls. Uh, yes, we know that uh, having health for all is a very important challenge. Uh, if we do not work on this agenda, by 2030, there will be 5 billion people without access to healthcare. So this is not like a, a random topic. This is about life or death. It's about inequalities. It's about having equal opportunities for all. So again, the first step is that this is a political decision. This is a commitment. And um, in my view as a parliamentarian, I consider that it is essential to expand and strengthen UHC legislation and regulation, set clear UHC national targets, and communicate better uh, to bring people together. There is a lack of trust that, that we need also to rebuild. The commitments have already been made, so accountability and transparency in progress towards the H uh, UHC agenda are essential. However, our findings still show that many countries lack measurable national targets and the public awareness of their government's commitment is very limited. Parliamentarians have a key role here. Our duty is to represent our constituencies and to ensure that their needs and demands are actually addressed. In this regard, we can and should be a driving force in holding governments accountable for their own commitments. So, being very clear, it's about legislation, about allocating budget, about oversight, and of course about representation and working closer with our communities. To that end, I would like to highlight some policy recommendations from our 2020 synthesis regarding UHC legislation, regulations, and accountability. First, governments should increase awareness among the populations about the UHC laws, regulations, and accountability mechanisms. This is essential so that people are able to hold their governments to account in meetings, their UHC commitments. Second, governments must commit themselves to set national UHC targets and communicate them clearly to multi-staker uh, uh, audiences at local, national and global levels. We need to translate international commitments into national realities. And for that goal, we need to work with everyone. We need to be fully inclusive. Accountability requires a common understanding of their commitments made. National targets should therefore be publicized openly and made understandable and accessible for population across the world. Third, parliamentarians will, ha will have a key role in translating the commitments made at the 2019 UN high-level meeting on UHC and the expectations of their electorate in appropriate legislation, especially where UHC laws and regulations are lacking. And finally, governments should institutionalize and mandate social and political accountability mechanisms and implement concrete plans to monitor the impacts of laws and policies on UHC. So to be very clear, there are some countries where uh, access to health is not properly reflected, even in their constitutions and in a very specific list on human rights. Then we need to develop a roadmap. That's why legislation exists. And of course, again, budget allocation. If we are not sending budget for infrastructure, for hospitals, for the health personnel, for all the people and materials that are needed for having universal health coverage, it will be only political narrative instead of a political commitment. Certainly, Honorable Baron, you mentioned the need to bolster our healthcare systems, especially when it comes to financing. Uh, Dr. Hakiba, let me bring you in on that. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic showed us how critical it is to strengthen our health systems. And, you know, conversations around this have really gathered voice, not just across uh, the continent, but around the world. What challenges do you see countries in Africa facing in terms of strengthening and, and financing healthcare systems? Thank you very much. Um, first and foremost, um, we have to keep pushing on prioritization of health in the financing of all the countries. As you rightly said, COVID-19 just showed us that um, even though we all use 
health services, we still are underfunding the, those services that we critically needed a few um, uh, months ago when this pandemic hit and actually revealed so many gaps, so many inefficiencies, and so many uh, lack of, of, of attention. So I think one of the key things is after the different call for commitment to increase the financing for health that uh, uh, the AU um, uh, supported last year uh, in 2019, it's important that we look into how do we move from that paper-based commitment to an actual um, uh, uh, disbursement for the health facilities, for the health providers to get what they need. So the other aspect is also that there is many initiatives that are going on that have been launched. For example, the access to commodities uh, and production within the continent. So we can no more work as individual countries. Uh, I think we, uh, uh, Dr. Tedros put it very well. He talked about how all the countries had to come together to make the vaccine a reality. Suddenly, a disease was not an issue of one country or one community, but rather global, a, a global issue. So I think that now we can see that the availability of services has to be, to be tackled by all the uh, countries the same way. This report is actually here to propose just that support. It will start the conversation or focus the conversation of, on availability of services, availability of drugs, uh, um, uh, capacity building of, of the, 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 the personnel, possibilities of integrating the services, and the reminder that health is not an issue of the health providers. The ministry of, ministers of finance today, they speak health more better than anyone because it has been such a high, it's so, so high on their agenda. So the military, the finance, the um, uh, political leaders, everybody is concerned about health. So as we move forward, COVID will, is here to stay again for a while. We need to remember that we, we had other issues, cause of, causes of mortalities before. We need to keep the focus on primary health care. Fund primary health care. We need to keep the focus of non-communicable diseases because all of those are really um, weakening our population. And when we talk about pandemic, it finds us in a very um, uh, um, a poor stage of health and we cannot combat anything. The other aspect is also the, the financial, financial prioritization and the way we buy services, who we buy from. We have had a huge push by the private sector. They were a little bit dormant on the site, not being involved, not getting involved, but then we saw how much support they could bring in. And so I think the countries have now uh, um, understood that the, we have no plan B. We need to finance the, 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 the health services and we need to be innovative in a way we do it so and we need to engage as many people as possible. And throughout the report, we see how uh, we give recommendation at every level, uh, all the way to technology innovation that will come and support the, 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 the service delivery. And remember that um, putting a service to scale does not specifically mean that it has to be expensive. Engaging the private sector does not mean that it has to be expensive. We need to be intentional in how we engage each and every one and making sure that we address the very problem that every country faces and they're pretty similar, but then the specific specificity of every country are key for the success of that um, uh, uh, enterprise. Thank you so much, Dr. Hakiba. Uh, in the interest of time, we have to bring at least this session to a very abrupt close, but 
some amazing insights coming from all of the panelists, uh, just in terms of what needs to be focused on to achieve UHC when it comes to Africa. It's not a one size fits all, as Dr. Hakiba said. Uh, it has to be targeted, it has to be customized to ensure uh, that each country is hitting where they need to in terms of universal health care. At this juncture, I'd like to hand over back to Lolem uh, and just uh, an announcement here for the next session in the platform from Auditorium. Click the button that says join and that will take you into the plenary session. Once again, thank you so much to all of my panelists on this. Uh, if you have a chance to please take the time to get into the report and, and understand just the richness and information that will be coming out of it. Lolem, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Victoria. And many, many thanks to all of our panelists. Um, this was just a really insightful panel. And as Victoria said, please do uh, click on the links and access the report. The executive summary is up, the opinion pieces are up and the full report will be available in the coming week. Thank you so much. We are going to segue right into our first massive plenary of the day. In between that, we will give you um, just a little bit of an interlude as we move into the first plenary, plenary one. Thank you, everybody.